workshop on uh, uh, the report of the Energy Committee. And I'll uh, turn it over to Tom Hoffman to talk on this. Yeah, as a byproduct or an output from the budget process last year, the Council had been considering a pay-to-throw program, decided not to advance that as part of the budget, and instead uh, want to take a step back and refer the general matter of solid waste reduction, if you will, to the Energy Committee. Um, I think they were the appropriate committee in that a number of existing committee members had an interest in the matter, and they have diligently taken the matter up over the last six or eight months and are finally in a position uh, to report back their findings. And so this evening you do have a number of members of the Energy Committee with you. Um, Deb McDonough was the chief researcher, author of the report, and will be the presenter as appropriate this <laughs> evening. And perhaps I'll just introduce uh, Rick Miking and let him introduce his colleagues from the committee. Sure, and we have Judy Roy, um, who's been on the committee for several years, and David, David. Kirsten. Right. Um, who's been on for, what, three years now? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Great. <coughs> so I think that's everybody from the committee. And Bill was formerly the liaison, and uh, now we're lucky to have Chris. Chris is the liaison. That's right. So if it pleases you, we'd love to have uh, Deb lead uh, us through the conversation, and uh, I think it would be time. We have an hour allotted, so there will be ample time on the back end, I think, for some conversation around wh where do we go from here. And if there are questions and that's appropriate during, certainly feel free to time it and ask those and remove them that's fine with me. Um, okay, doke. So we're talking about garbage, we're talking about trash. Um, and just a quick reminder of where that fits within the budget. Our pine tree contract is a negotiated price for hauling that material away. We also pay <coughs> EMAIN for the municipal solid waste. We don't pay them an additional fee for material they take as recycling. And then we budget some for cart maintenance, which is also something that can't be well adjusted. So jumping to the summary, I've got this right at the beginning of the report. It's also present on the slides for you as well. Um, we are recommending that the council set a goal of achieving a material reduction in solid waste. As we get through the presentation, you'll see some of the points at which we got into big arguments about how you set a numerical goal, what a reasonable numerical goal would be, what those metrics might be. And we don't feel like we're in a position to make a specific numerical goal, um, but do feel like there's progress that we can make in reducing the amount of material that's going in that solid waste stream. And so we do have a series of recommendations that we'll go through um, as we move through the presentation, recommendations on education and outreach, on concrete actions that the town can take to lead uh, by example. We do recommend um, hiring an individual to coordinate these activities, and we'll talk some about funding for that as we move through the presentation. And um, at the end of that list there, you see that there, we think that there are next phase recommendations, <coughs> that it does make sense to really revisit pay to throw options in a robust community process, and then would also encourage the council to um, investigate universal curbside composting options as a parallel activity. So, um, as Tom mentioned, we are here because a year ago there was a consideration of the Waste Zero proposal, um, and many of you were here in a part of that conversation, but just a quick reminder of what that program would entail. And those of you who were here remember that there were loud objections from the community, some in letters to the editor, some in present, uh, comments in uh, town council, and probably through other, other mechanisms that I'm not aware of. And so the sense is that that was a big shift. <coughs> there were concerns about a new fee. There were some uh, misconceptions that that new fee was straight up a new fee and not then to be reduced from the town budget. Uh, as I was reading letters to the editor and things, it was clear that there were some of those misconceptions. Um, there were concerns that bags would be loose on the street, even though that was never the, the proposal. Um, some of us were concerned about adding extra plastic to the waste stream in an effort to reduce the waste stream. And then there were some concerns, too, about cost of program management. Now, the way that Waste Zero sets their program up, they collect the money from the bags and provide much of that money back to the town. It's not as obvious in the proposals that I was reading, but as you read through and do some math from the numbers that are there, there is a fee that Waste Zero is taking for services and supplies from that income from the bag sales. And so that is a net fee to the community, even if it's not turning up in the town council's budget line, it is a fee to the community in moving to that sort of a system. 
Okay, and so this is what y'all did. You uh, turned this back over to us at the Energy Committee, and um, here we are ready to come back and talk to you. So as we look at Scarborough's recycling rate that you guys looked at last year as well, it certainly um, looks like there's room for us to improve. So here's that time prior to curbside collection of recycling. As we introduce curbside collection of recycling and do a lot of education and outreach in that first year, we see our recycling rate jump and then start to move down over the next several years. <coughs> um, this is the last year. The numbers went up. It's often difficult to understand exactly why and exactly how, but it's certainly possible that all the conversations over the course of last spring about recycling and about the potential for a pay as you throw program and reminding people of what those rules were may have had a piece of an effect. Now, as the Energy Committee has been talking about this over the last couple of months, we've actually let go of this recycling rate as a metric because there's a couple of different ways that we can look at it. The recycling rate is a mixture of information coming from the amount of recycling that's being collected and also the amount of garbage that's being collected. And my husband tells stories of his time at IBM where they got a mandate from above to increase the recycling rate and they were having a hard time doing it and people started taking whole boxes of like printer paper and dumping them into the recycling because that will increase your recycling rate. <laughs> and clearly that's not, not the way in which we're trying to move. So what you're looking at here is those same recycling rates but now by tons of material the red bars above are the garbage rates. It's interesting to notice that the total amount of stuff that's being hauled away has been decreasing over time, even though population has been increasing in that period of time. Mm. There are some hypotheses about recessions and what that does to purchasing behaviors, and there's a lot of ways you can <coughs> chat about this, but it's very difficult to get good data on exactly what has been happening. We actually have turned this over in our heads. So this is the exact same information, but flipped over to where what we're monitoring now, what we're thinking about now, is the amount of garbage that's being carted away, independent of what exactly is going on with the recycling. And that's where our recommendation is that the goal be stated in terms of reduction of that garbage, of that municipal waste, <coughs> as opposed to focusing attention on the aspect of a recycling percentage or a recycling rate. And so when we look at that, what we see is that we've got this drop here that we talked about before as we introduce that curbside recycling that gives people an easier way to get material to the recycling stream. Um, but then we see that the garbage holds fairly steady over those years um, with some changes in what's being recycled. Um, we also spent some time evaluating a report from the University of Maine looking at what is in our garbage. So these folks actually took a couple truckloads of garbage from a number of communities around the state, but uh, Scarborough was included, in different seasons and picked through it to see what's there. Um, the pictures are lovely. Uh, they are wearing masks. They have gloves on. They have like suits over their clothes. And what they're noticing, and this is actually Scarborough specific data that we got in an hmm. email from um, the folks that did that work, is that in our garbage, the stuff that we are paying EcoMaine to uh, burn at the uh, waste energy plant, 19% uh, of that material is recyclable. 40% of that material is compostable food. Um, this <coughs> non-recyclable paper means like tissues and paper towels and stuff like that. Very little of that is leaves and grass. Our community is doing a good job of keeping that leaves and grass out of the garbage. You know, that's my understanding. We don't have uh, an ordinance that requires that. But the way we've got our tubs set up, there's just not a lot of room there to be throwing your grass clippings into the garbage. Um, so, I what think we, I think oh. we considered that one of the most important charts because it, it told the story that 40% uh, of of our recycling stream potential is in compostables. Mm -hmm. Only 19% is in uh, recyclables. And so if you're going to make an impact on reducing what goes, and the compostables don't burn well, mm -hmm. so that when they go to Echo Main, uh, that, uh, that's not really doing them much of a favor. Hmm. OK. And so one of the ways that's been helpful for me to think about this is to take last year's waste stream. So there's the captured recycling, the stuff that actually went into the recycling tubs, and there's that 33.6% recycling that we had in that particular fiscal year, and the tonnage of municipal solid waste that was collected during that year. And now this is not 2011, but what I've done is 
projected those distributions onto this waste stream. So here is the 19% of what was left. So we're now looking at the total 100% of everything that's hauled away. 33% of that was the recycling that we captured. An additional 12% is recycling that was in the garbage. 27% of everything was compostable organics. And then some of that is still waste that we don't have a good other stream for. Um, and so we're going to be going through this slide in a couple of different ways and looking at a couple of those different numbers. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. So that 12.6% there, um, combined with the 336 so yes. is that suggesting that the range of total recyclable would be anywhere from 45 to 52% because of the 19%? Okay, so the 19% needs to go away. As a, let's jump back over here. That, so this is 19% of the municipal solid waste. Right. So that is 19% of the 5,000 tons uh, that okay. are here. Right. Yep. And so that's uh, almost 1,000 tons that are here, which is 12% of the total waste. So I was looking at there, was if you add these two numbers up, if we were able to recycle yeah. absolutely yeah. everything, yep. we get to 45, 46% right. recycling. Yep. If you look at what um, Waste Zero is proposing, they're estimating a 50% recycling. They do acknowledge that when you use a uh, volume-based pricing mechanism, some material goes away. Now, some of that may be compostable, that people start composting in their backyard, certainly in the case of Portland. That's about the same time that Garbage to Garden started collecting, and there was a mechanism for moving some of that material out of the waste stream. Um, the interesting thing that I've learned since I've started doing more reading and talking to some of the consultants that work with communities on pay as you throw programs is that each community's experience has been different. It depends a lot on what was happening before you started that. And so did you or did you not have a curbside uh, recycling program? Did you or did you not have high participation in that program? What was the status of education and outreach at that time? And so we're seeing different results and different responses in a lot of different communities, and the data is really all over the board. So it would be interesting to me if we were to talk to Waste Zero again to try to get a better handle on exactly where and how they're getting those numbers. I've talked to consultants who don't think that those were reasonable numbers. I've seen data from other communities <coughs> that don't get to that level. We certainly see some evidence in Maine of communities getting to that level. But again, there's a lot of moving parts here. It's a lot, very difficult to predict exactly what will happen. And that's part of our hesitation in trying to put a numerical goal on this is because I don't think we're at a point where we can predict what a rational, reasonable numerical goal is to set us up either to be successful or to push us or I, I don't know where that number belongs and I don't know how to think about that at this point. Um, okay, so the data is very, very strong that pay-as-you-throw programs effectively change behavior. And you guys would have heard about that from Waste Zero. And so when you charge people for the stuff they're sending to the dump, people send less stuff to the dump. There are a lot of different ways in which that <coughs> happens. They send some stuff elsewhere. They change their buying behaviors. All kinds of things happen. Um, it is not at all unusual for communities to respond in the way that ours did. In fact, that sounds to be the norm, that when these programs are first presented to communities, uh, people within those communities um, are very, very resistant, have a lot of concerns. Um, the interesting thing to me is that the first programs are actually in California in the 1930s. So it's not a new thing to talk about charging by volume. The people who work on these sorts of programs remind us that this is sort of the last unmetered utility. We don't just give people electricity and charge them $9 a month or whatever that number would be. We set their bill based on how much they use. We set their water bill based on how much they use. But in much of the country, we hadn't been setting the garbage bill based on how much you're using that particular service. <coughs> that makes sense. Now, the EPA jumped on the bandwagon in the 1990s. There's a lot of outreach material available from the EPA in the 1990s. Um, some states, Massachusetts in particular, um, maintains a robust outreach program in encouraging their communities to move to pay as you throw programs. Um, there is a 2015 survey, but the data is not yet available. Um, but we're on the street is that the number of participating communities has continued to climb. Um, most of the largest cities in the country are using some <coughs> volume-based pricing. And in states that have really taken the initiative here, as much as 80% of the population in those states are paying volume-wise for their garbage collection. 
Um, the data in indicates that a successful launch required six to nine months of education and communication with the community and taking questions and resolving um, concerns and listening to those concerns and adjusting programs in response to those concerns. But the really interesting thing is that when those programs get off the ground, in almost every case, surveys after the fact show 90% support because mm -hmm. people are able to say, oh, well, I'm only paying for the garbage that I'm throwing away. And my neighbor who's throwing away twice as much is paying twice as much, and I'm okay with that. And so people tend to be very strongly supported later. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of high-profile cases, <laughs> one of them right here in Maine, where voters went back to the ballot box afterwards and yanked that back after pay as you throw had been introduced. That's been very, very rare. Um, and the cases where it has been pulled back are cases where the upfront education was lacking. And so um, we do recommend as an energy committee that uh, we establish some sort of community process to evaluate how best to move forward on that. Um, as we're looking through what's being done across the country, certainly the pay-as-you-throw bags are very, very common here in the Northeast. In most cases, those are simply set at the curb. Uh, what we were proposing here in Scarborough was putting them into the curbside carts that we had, which had some folks concerned about enforcement and how do you know what's in the cart and under the bag and how to do that. Sounds like Kennebunk has been doing that for the last year, six months. When did that roll out there? And they feel like that's been very successful. That certainly remains an option. The more common option in Western states is um, variable subscription fees based on cart sizes. So if a person has a 64-gallon cart, the standard in Scarborough, they pay a certain amount of money. People would then have a choice to have a smaller cart, say a 32-gallon cart, uh, or a larger cart to have more garbage collected and pay a different amount for those subscription rates. Um, and the data indicates that those two styles of programs are comparable in terms of the reduction <coughs> in garbage um, with some slight, uh, slightly higher but not statistically significant um, performance in pay throw bag programs where the volumes are smaller and you're paying one at a time. Um, there's some analysis that's referenced in the report uh, that was done for the city of Asheville, North Carolina, actually comparing those two, very similar to what we might be thinking about in this community. Um, and you're welcome to read that in more detail. The upshot of that was that the community would end up paying less over time with variable cart sizes despite the costs required to purchase those carts up front. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, I don't feel like, I think it would be jumping out ahead to recommend a specific program at this point, um, that doing that successfully would require a series of open community meetings, presenting what we know about the situation, letting people make comments, express their concerns, um, and work to educate and help people to understand what we're proposing and how that might work. So. What can we do in the meantime? Um, I want to talk first about the recycling line and then in a few minutes about the compostable organics line. Um, certainly one option is to increase education and outreach. In that first year, our recycling rate, and again, I'm moving away from that as a metric, but it's certainly one way to think about things, was higher than it is now. And if our recycling rate, all other things unchanged, had been 36.1% last year instead of 33.6%, an additional 191 tons of material would have been recycled and we would have saved $13,000 in and avoided tipping fees. Um, and so in some ways what I think that that states is that the work we did up front, um, we had a half-time person who was paid off of a grant that did education and outreach at the start of our uh, recycling <coughs> program. Um, and that person's time I think was saving us money at that point in time and that it may make sense, that's where the recommendation for a sustainability coordinator comes in, to hire someone part-time to manage education and outreach. And so as we looked into it, it seems like um, new construction, when people get brand new carts, uh, those carts are coming with a packet of materials talking about what is recyclable and what goes where and how the process works. Um, but a number of houses in town have been sold in the last 10 years from one owner to another owner and we have not had a process of educating those new residents or new renters to what our recycling program is. Um, avail information is available on the web but a person would have to take the initiative to go and search for that. Um, there haven't been articles in the paper, we haven't had that kind of outreach. Ecomain has done some work, there have been some ads on the television, they've done some work in the public schools uh, more regionally. Um, but there's not been a lot of outreach and education here in town for our own citizens. 
So one of the things we do recommend is committing to a program of ongoing education and outreach, and we'll talk more about some of those suggestions in a few minutes because I think composting goes into that education and outreach as well. Okay, and so we recommend this ongoing education and outreach, and then as we've been looking around, <coughs> recycle bins are hard to find in a lot of the municipal facilities around town. The schools have recycle bins in most of the classrooms and in most of the offices, um, but I don't know where they are here. No. And so we did not actually determine what it would cost to buy them and what it would cost to ensure that they were emptied properly, and we don't have access to that kind of information, so we stopped short of making that in a detailed, like exactly what to do and what to buy and who does what. But we certainly recommend that council charge whomever the appropriate persons would be um, to ensure that recycling is easy to do in municipal facilities. Um, and so, the next line item is those compostable organics. And um, as Bill said, that's actually double the mass of the recycling that's not currently being pulled from the municipal waste stream. But we certainly can do something with that recycling. There's a bigger piece of material, bigger chunk of material right there. And so just a quick list here, ways that that organic material can be pulled from the waste stream include backyard composting. And so, uh, and we'll talk about each of these things in turn. Um, there are a couple of companies regionally that are doing subscription curbside compost collection. We'll talk about them as well. Um, each of those companies is um, available to set up centralized drop-off sites in town. We can talk a little bit about that. And then separate it off down here at the bottom, because these first three things are things that we can do very quickly and we can do at very, very low cost. Um, universal co cur curbside composting, um, I think, again, requires that sort of community process to talk about what that would entail, how that might look, how that might function. <coughs> um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit before we go today, but that's a bigger uh, issue than uh, what we're prepared to report on today. So backyard composting. Um, many of us don't know, but Public Works actually stocks plastic composting bins. Mm -hmm. There was an effort to advertise that several years ago. I know I bought one at the time, um, but we haven't continued that outreach. And so it would certainly be a low cost um, activity to include information <coughs> about availability of those composting bins in any material we send out on recycling and um, the recycling program in town. Um, Scarborough Conservation Commission, by the way, is hosting a backyard composting workshop that's coming up in April, and so we can continue working to get the word out with them on that opportunity for <coughs> um, Down here, how much stuff is going out the door that way is hard to measure, it's hard to monitor, it's hard to know. But the cost to the, cost to the town are almost zero. It's adding extra lines to education and outreach that we're recommending for recycling, um, the recycling program in any case. Um, so there are two companies, Garbage to Garden and We Compost It, that are both uh, collecting compostable materials curbside regionally. Each of those um, companies <coughs> has a set of communities that they're working in. There's some overlap between those communities. And we've had conversations with both of them about what it would take to launch in Scarborough. Um, with an interest in doing some, trading some of our outreach efforts, including information about their services and some of the material we're getting out to residents, for some data back from them as to what they're actually collecting here and how many people are participating to get a sense of what those participation rates might be. Garbage to Garden has the longest experience in Portland, um, where they have about one in seven households participating at this time and are pulling out what amounts to about um, a third of a ton of garbage per household per year. So um, there's some sizable uh, amount of material that's there. Now if we were to roll that out in Scarborough and get to those participation rates, um, there are a couple of uh, things to talk about here. So first of all, this is several years of work in advertising and working in Portland to get to those rates. and Portland has had a pay as zero garbage program in place during that period of time. And so people are going to have to pay to get rid of stuff and it doesn't feel as, may, may not feel like as big of a shift to pay garbage to garden to take the compost as to pay the garbage people to take the garbage. It does end up costing them more, um, but it may feel different um, in a place where you're already paying for garbage. And so if we were able to get to that mm. state, this is just math on the numbers that we have. Um, at that rate, we might be pulling out 12% of the available organics, which is 3% of the total waste stream, avoiding some tipping costs. Town budget is not taking on these costs. Those costs are being taken on, though, by the community 
in the form of the subscription fees that folks would be paying to one of these companies to collect that composting. Um, but getting the information out, again, costs the town very little. Um, we compost, yes, sorry. Just, just a quick question that, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was the big issue last time about what was it going to cost additionally to households. And you said they may feel differently. Is there any evidence that people feel differently about paying more <coughs> for sort of, you the know, organic to garden? is that there are higher participation rates in communities that have pay-as-you-throw programs, but the communities that have pay-as-you-throw pro uh, programs are a slightly different profile than communities that don't, and so that may be the same communities that are more likely to participate in the recycling. There's not a lot of good survey data that I've found, but there's some anecdotal data and there's some observational data. I, I also think it's important to point out too that with the composting arrangement, you're getting something in return as well. You're you're, you're sending your composting, but you're getting you're getting mulch and or, oh, you or a loan back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, each uh, yeah. company yeah. sets yeah. it up in a different way, and wow. I've got their um, web addresses in the yeah. report as well. You can go look. Each company has different costs, right. different ways that they uh, perform their service how much compost they give back to you or what reduced rates that. to get. There's a lot of different things. Yeah. And so I'm not really trying to go through the details on how either of those systems okay. work, but simply encouraging town council to consider including information on each of those companies and their offerings each time we send out information about what's now recycling program, backyard composting options, and subscription curbside composting options regionally. Um, both companies are really ready to move into Scarborough and each of them have said that they would probably do that in the next year or two on their own, but that they can move faster if they're going to get support from us in helping to get the word out and encouraging people to participate in that way. Um, centralized drop-off sites is sort of a new concept for us as a committee. This has come onto our radar really in the last month or so. Um, we composted, approached us with a proposal very similar to what they're doing in Valmont and a couple of other communities. <coughs> so what they've done in some of these communities is set up bins for the compost at the transfer station, for example, and community members can simply come there and dump their compost into those bins and then we compost it comes and hauls that away. Um, at a cost to the town, the town would be paying for that service. Um, we then approached Garbage to Garden to ask if that's something that they might be able to do as well. And we have some information from both of them. It's a bit of a comparing apples to oranges and would certainly encourage town council to task someone in staff, probably in public works, with sifting through those proposals and evaluating them to determine which of them makes the most sense in our context. Um, but it is a low cost <coughs> way to get rid of, the, get some of that material pulled out of the garbage stream. Um, <coughs> We composted has actually said they've been a little bit surprised by the level of participation in Falmouth. Like they just didn't have any idea what would happen when they mm -hmm. launched this. Um, Don't you know if Falmouth has curbside pickup or are they still bringing I think the everybody's the bringing their stuff to the transfer station. Yeah. But you know what? I've read about so many programs in this region in the last yeah, yeah. six months you that don't and take them. Cumberland and the <coughs> three major communities. Cape Walls. Cape, Cape Walls. Yeah. 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 And so communities where people are already taking their Major's garbage right. to the dump, yeah. that may make Could sense. Yeah. But what we've been talking about um, with each of those companies is maybe setting up three or four sites around town identifying places. I don't know if those are schools or firehouses or whatever. I think that's a process for public works and the companies to get more engaged in to decide where it might make sense to put those. But again, if we're able to do that, um, it costs us $70.23 a ton in a tipping fee. And so if Garbage to Garden would take the stuff for $50 a ton, it's been a little bit more difficult for me to do the math on um, we compost its proposal because theirs is a collection, uh, uh, like a stop fee plus a tote, like it's just set up differently. Um, but I think it's possible to get this set up so that it is a net win to the town budget no matter what happens. Um, especially with the way that Garbage to Garden has theirs established, I think there's very little risk to us. But again, somebody who thinks about these things from the um, municipal side should really look at both of those and talk through what those options would look like. But, oh, and now we have our um, proposal, our recommendations in just a minute. Okay. 
And then so the big leap <coughs> then would be what would it look like or what would it take to move to universal curbside composting? So in the, um, sorry about that, um, in the 70s and 80s, communities were starting to move to curbside recycling and that was a new thing and it was very, very uncommon. At this point, that's very, very common. Universal curbside composting is currently relatively uncommon. There are communities around the country that are doing that um, in a variety of different ways. The processing costs are certainly lower than the processing costs for garbage, um, but the collection costs is where things can start to get expensive. And so if, for example, you were to roll out something like garbage to garden at every house in town, a dedicated collection, a special separate truck that comes to get that material, um, what did we run math at like $100,000 added to the budget to try to do, like, sure, you save some money on tipping fees, but you pay so much more in mm -hmm. collection that it ends up costing more. Um, there are other mechanisms that are being used in other places. Um, some of us have been particularly intrigued with this idea of every other week collection where the truck takes the organics every week and takes the garbage one week and the recycling another week and the garbage one week and the recycling another week because once the smelly stuff is out of the garbage, that's the food that mm, some communities have very successfully moved to that. So uh, Portland, Oregon and Hamilton, Maine are doing that every other week collection and both of them are available to talk to us again if we get to the point where we're trying to think through more about what this might look like. So EcoMaine actually did a detailed study. It's available on the web. The link is available in the report in 2013. At the time, no community was ready to step up and be the test case and some other things were going on for EcoMaine and so that has not actually launched anywhere regionally. Um, and their estimates, I would love, if we're ready to talk about this more, to sit down with them and get a better handle on how those estimates were put together. A couple of things have changed since then. So um, there, is a, there is an anaerobic composter just up in Exeter, Maine, um, and they're charging $40 a ton to take that material. When EcoMaine was talking about how to get set up, they were needing some upfront costs to get ready to do that, but that facility is now available and materials can be sent there. So that wasn't a part of, of the EcoMaine report, um, but that's something that certainly could be evaluated at this point. So when I run through the numbers on that, it looks to me like if you were able to, uh, in every report I read, it's the political will that's the hold up here in terms of moving to every other week's collection. That's the language that's used in every one of these conversations um, because I think that there would be pushback. And so certainly working with communities that have made that kind of transition would be absolutely critical in making that kind of transition successfully. Thinking about what to do with extra garbage and what accommodations do you make and how can people pay for that and how do you do that, there's a lot of things to think about. Um, but again, with an open community process to really pour through this, um, it looks to me like you could move to every other week collection, separating out the compostables in much the same way that we've been separating out the recyclables um, in the last 10 years. Um, and the upfront costs of buying additional bins need to be factored into that. It looks like it would be sort of an equal cost for the first five years when you're paying for those bins and then the costs drop because you're paying the $40 processing costs instead of the $70 tipping costs. But again, we would need to do more evaluation, more work with EcoMaine. There's a lot of stuff to be done there that hasn't been done, but I think it is worth exploring further. Okay, and so our recommendations to you on organics are to include information about composting and all the outreach efforts we do on recycling, um, to introduce compost bins at municipal facilities and events where appropriate, and to establish drop-off sites for household organic waste, to move forward with one of those proposals and establish three to five drop-off sites or whatever makes sense as that conversation moves forward and include that information then also in any of this ongoing education and outreach. And then include evaluation of universal curbside composting with that evaluation of pay as you throw programming um, in, a, in a parallel or unified process because those two things can work very nicely together um, in providing a way to move the compostable materials out it can be more palatable to move to a pay-as-you-throw program. There's a lot of data on recycling. The communities that introduced curbside recycling when they did pay-as-you-throw have had an easier time of it than communities that tried to add that on at a separate time. Okay.
Education and outreach is going to be critical to anything we do, whether that is trying to talk about making some further changes or more successfully using what we're doing right now. Um, that that education and outreach has to be ongoing. It can't be a sort of once every decade kind of a thing. Um, because people forget and new people come and people simply need that information. I, I mean, I can't tell you the number of arguments that we've had in the Energy Committee about whether something is or isn't recyclable because we don't know either. Um, and it's not always easy to get answers to those questions right immediately. And so we would encourage, uh, encourage development of an ongoing program and setting uh, timings and cycles. And so whether that includes putting stickers on those curbside recycling carts that include more information right there on the cart, whether that involves uh, putting an insert into a tax bill at some point, giving information every year or every few years about the recycling program and composting options, whether that means we identify new residents as those houses change hands and make sure that a packet of information gets to each of those individuals as they come into town, um, and there are clearly other ways that, that information can get out to the community. But that takes time, and somebody has to write those materials and deliver those materials and deal with all of that stuff. And so um, this recommendation of a sustainability quarter actually overlaps with a re recommendation from the Energy Committee report, what, four years ago? When was that report? Nearly six years ago six now. Six years ago. Six. Okay, time flies. Um, where we were recommending... Um, recommending an energy position, somebody to guide the town through grant writing and identifying opportunities and some of the work that the energy committee has done but requires some, like not more than once a month meeting to make the kind of progress that we'd like to see made on some of these things. In addition, the energy committee goals include education and outreach to the community on energy issues for homeowners in their own homes and that's something the Energy Committee has had very little time to uh, pursue with the work that we've also been doing. And so what we're suggesting at this point is that that single position could achieve many <coughs> of these goals, um, and we expect that that salary could be offset, at least in part, by avoided tipping fees and in reduced energy costs as well. I mean, you've seen that several of the things that the Energy Committee has brought forward are in a position to save the town uh, money over time. And so, uh, oh, and the other thing, what did I put on there? Oh, yes. And that's a, a, that would provide a key point person <coughs> to really guide that pay to throw composting process through a uh, community conversation. Okay. And so this is really, this is exactly the same slide that we showed at the beginning. Um, and so, again, we're not able or willing or ready to talk about a numerical goal and whether that should be in percent recycling or whether that should be in tons of garbage or how, what numbers we <coughs> should be looking at. Um, but certainly taking some of these actions and continuing to monitor that progress and see what things are working and what things are not working um, puts us in a position to save some money on those tipping fees while also uh, reducing impact on the environment in the ways that we're just, the ways that we're managing the waste that's coming out of our community. So, that is what we have to say for today. Would, um, would the Energy Committee members yeah. like to add a comment before the town council members? Just kudos to Deb for pulling that all together. I think one of the other things we had talked about, and I missed that it wasn't in there, was talking about the bins are now tagged so that they can be they can be scanned, and that's mm. an important point. And yeah. there is the capability of weighing. Not yet. Or could be. Tom and I have talked about this a couple of times, yeah. and so that was part of the initial conversation. There are actually no communities in the United States that are billing by trash on the basis of weight. Um, I say that with more confidence than I really have. I've read that there are none. There are some European communities that are doing it on the basis of weight. There's actually a town in Michigan that people can set their garbage bin out every week or every other week and their tags are red and they get billed only for the times they set it out. There's all kinds of things that can be done. But those are one of the things that's, you know, looked at. And I think, you know, involving real estate agents too, who people mm -hmm. buy and like that, mm -hmm. and that educational outreach, which I think that's the key element mm -hmm. at this point. Sure. And, yeah. well, Thanks, Judy. Thanks. <laughs> I'm in your commission. <laughs> I'd just like to to not let the the public 
uh, gloss over the term organics because one of the big problems with, <coughs> with the waste stream and the potential solution from composting is the moisture content, the water content, mm. and um, it adds weight to the trucks, and it's kind of pointless to send water to the burn plant. And, and so that's something that um, the, the <coughs> public might uh, internalize a little better if we, if we just uh, make that obvious. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a backyard composter, but I also have a garden. So that doesn't apply to everyone. <coughs> and I'm a backyard composter and can hardly wait to turn that job over to one of these <laughs> companies to <laughs> take it away yeah. and bring it back done. Because my small volume composting isn't hot enough to kill the weed season. It's driving yeah. me crazy. I want somebody else to do and that. And I have chickens, so I shouldn't mind all of the chicken <laughs> <laughs> I have I have them, but I have too many bins. And, uh, I, I, think, I think the only thing, you know, is, is really the committee's, um, and thanks to Deb for really taking this on, really the paradigm change here is, is not looking so much at what we're recycling but what we're putting into that waste stream and what we can remove out of that. So it's, it's definitely a different way to uh, approach this. Um, and with that, probably it, it does require a, a uh, higher level of outreach and education to our, to our citizens. We've heard it said that composting is where recycling was 20, 30 years ago. <coughs> that the recognition mm -hmm. that if you want to move the needle, composting is where you have to focus attention and it, it's more difficult because of the odor issues, right. the size of the container issues, the inability to pick them up uh, as easily simultaneously. <coughs> so, uh, that, uh, there are some really interesting paradigms out there, some really interesting things that communities have done and so there's work that we could certainly do to learn more about the options. Yeah. And I think there may be some really good solutions at this point. Mm -hmm. To have that sustainability coordinator, sit, even on a part-time basis, to sift through, continue to sift through the information and to, to really uh, pull things tighter together. So it's in your hands now, Bill. Uh, <laughs> let's, go, let's go around the table uh, and just get comments and thoughts from each company. Um, I agree with it's what we need to take out of the waste stream. I have a question, and it has to do with my memory. Um, I remember as a child having garbage men coming to the house, this is in South Portland, okay. and taking what would be in effect organic. We kept it under the porch, walked on the porch of the raccoons or whatever thing uh -huh. it was, it was food. Yeah. And I'm curious if anyone's looked back as to what were they were doing back then. Because you also had a separate garbage dump man who came to take the other stuff. Yeah. Was that now you have a truck that drives and doesn't get out of the cab. And you just right. I know, up. but I'm just that. curious. So that so what were they doing then, and how do we get away from they, that? They had to be some farmers, and I mean, they're talking about feeding pigs and this chickens. Was, this, mean, was the the t this was the city of South Portland. But, was, know, that, but was that back when the main mall was a pig farm? <laughs> it was before that. No, it was before that. No, it was before that. You didn't know what it was a pig farm. I mean, I don't know. That's a curiosity question. Someone that could do some research on it. There was plenty of farmland in, in South Portland back when you I know, but I'm just saying it was a municipal. Well, part municipal. of what happened nationally and, and over, the, over the world is that a shift towards inorganic fertilizers right. that had been so cheap for so long, right. people stopped wondering about that stuff, and that right. really became garbage. Um, certainly if we go back further, used clothing was fodder for quilts instead of buying new material right. for that. And so we certainly had a shift in terms of how we think about our waste and that that there was a shift to just chuck it all and then there was some pullback from that with right. recycling and I think it's that we're now at that cusp of that next round of pullback. So, um, so then know. going down that road, I mean, I, I don't know what's going on in South Portland. I am a real estate broker. Mm -hmm. And I know one day I was showing some houses in South Portland and people had a lot of garbage to garden mm -hmm. out. And I don't know if that's something they're paying for separately or if homeowners are paying in for that. That So that's a subscription yeah. service. And um, garbage to garden is functioning in, I think I counted seven or eight communities at this right. point. And we compost it is including Scarborough, yeah. And they're, they're working they're Scarborough. Are they doing any households? 
Well, last thanks. Time I, they weren't doing I don't. I don't. Last time I they were looking to come in. Well, they're definitely yeah. at the school. I know that yeah. for sure. And I think they're using that as the springboard to broaden yeah. out. I think from from yeah. the meeting that we had, I was the impression he was trying to move that yeah. forward very quickly. Yeah. And they would both both of those companies would love to move into the residential market here in Scarborough, but each of them need to have a certain right. number of households participating before it makes sense to drive a truck. Before it makes sense to drive a truck. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I, but yeah. I know that we had I know that we had a lot of political pushback last year on pay to throw and I was one of them because mm -hmm. I just saw and I get the whole thing because it costs money to toss anything away mm -hmm. it costs money but I also understand where uh, householders are coming from because we went to this two streams of throwing mm -hmm. stuff away where you have a recycling bin and a regular bin and then to ask people to go out and pay extra for bags and I know there have been some issues with waste zero questions about them from mm -hmm. other towns I've talked to. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we could do something with, with the organic stream I think would be a good place to start and then educate people as to what it costs to throw away trash. And throw anything in the trash. And at some level we've moved to a more metered system already. Like if I look back at what the ordinance has said when I moved here, I think I was limited to no more than 12 75 gallon barrels a week. Um, so it was sort of limited. Um, and now we've cut that down quite a bit. Right. Um, and so what some communities are doing is saying you can have that service for free or some set service for free or for your taxes and then you pay if you need or want more. So there's a lot of different ways to play with that mm -hmm. in terms of, of how the finances are set up mm -hmm. and in terms of how that, like, and noticing it being pulled out of the town budget as a standalone program as opposed to a sort of black hole town thing. They pay for it and mm -hmm. it goes. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Peter, I guess similarly, just kind of piggybacking on, I guess, because I was sort of in the first round of conversations about the pay as you throw, mm -hmm. and, and um, certainly we got a lot of feedback from the community. Yeah. So. What I haven't heard tonight, and I think in order to make this go, mm -hmm. we'd really have to have a compelling story to tell. And, I, and I'm not sure I've heard that compelling story of why the average household, I, I think you're going to have those folks that are into, you know, the environment and those types of things mm -hmm. are going to, but I, I don't think that's yet the majority of our residents. And so for us, or for me, mm -hmm. I would really have to hear about what are, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. yes but people are going to be impacted differently financially and, and mm -hmm. based on some of the things that you shared. And that's going to be, we got to think about how we do that, especially given when you talk about a new position. Mm -hmm. I'm looking ahead saying, geez, it sure seems like this budget season is going to be another tough one Absolutely. where we're going to be have to making tough choices about lots of different mm -hmm. things. So I need a little bit more about the story. Why are we doing this? What's in it for the average resident? Mm -hmm. okay. And why should they? It, I don't need the answers now. Right. But it, but I sit here saying, and, I, and I'm sort of a genius. I've got two waste bins, mm -hmm. recyclable and not. Yeah. If I have to go to a third, yeah. I'm not going to do it. I mean, I, I just I, I'm going to. So I just we need to think about yeah. it. So it's very complex, and I, I, based on where we were last time with the pushback, we and need to we need to address that. I think that that information is available, both the EPA and the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection have reams of outreach materials that have been prepared um, and used in a variety of communities. But, but the, the, the bigger question is going to be, is it going to, am I going to pay more than I do right. now for what I do? Well, and if I'm going to pay more, we're going to have an issue yeah, right. packaging it. And the answer to that question is that if you throw away more than average, you might. But if you throw away less than average or change your behavior so you don't throw right. away as much, then you're going to pay less. And you get control over that bill in a way that you don't if like I, for example, have been using the 32-gallon garbage can for 10 years with four kids and two in diapers for a while um, because when you compost and you do things differently, that's easy. But I am paying the same amount as the diagonal across that got a 96-gallon bin because they felt like the 64 wasn't enough. But, it's, but, it, but I think your point earlier, it's going to be critical to have the community needs to decide. Absolutely. Who is going to be winners and losers and what do they want. And, that, Absolutely. and that's going to be a spirited conversation. Mm -hmm. And it is. And we need to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And I think and the guidance is available. That up front. We've yeah. got to have the community mm -hmm. old fashioned mm -hmm. really hash it out. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's going to be over time. Oh. Yeah. 
Chris? Yeah, so having the benefit of sitting on the on the Energy Committee for the last three or four meetings now, um, I, I can recognize that, that really, I mean, Deb's done a fantastic yeah, job yeah. just boiling yeah, it down absolutely. to even these <coughs> the denominators. The, the, the process itself is incredibly complex. Right. There's, there's mountains and mountains of data to sift through. So, um, you know, it strikes me that um, I, I think certainly the pay as you throw program, if we move in that direction, it would be over time. And we discussed that even in committee about how we would transition. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a, a process I think we could develop if we, you know, over some time to get community buy-in and, and do some piloting or something first to really kind of ease it in. Um, but I think there's the takeaway from, from this report for me is there's some, there's some real impacts we could make short term. On the educational side of things, um, with very little investment and very little cost, I think we could, we could work on some things that we talked about with stickers on the bins and things like that for increased recycling awareness maybe some more outreach with, you know, community TV or, you know, flyers or things like that, and the tax bills was another opportunity or something like that. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's these little steps we can take, I think, that will make a good interim um, uh, process. I think the composting side of things, um, and I'm, I'm still biased because I'm, I'm, I still have kind of a half foot on the school side of things, um, Garvis <coughs> Gar has done a great job <coughs> in the school system with educating the kids, um, putting the bins in place, doing multiple resorts. I mean, we did a, uh, a harvest lunch um, at, at Wentworth last year, and the, and the fifth graders would tell you, you know, I scratch it. If it scratches wax, it doesn't go in recycling. It goes over here, <laughs> and this part goes here, and this part goes here. So, so they, they're, they've got that information and that base knowledge much better than the adults do. So I think any kind of effort that we put forth as a community has to take those things into account a little bit and try and utilize some of those resources we have now. Um, so I, I, I mean, I see this as an opportunity to get maybe the, the high schoolers or the Ecos Club involved a little bit more with potential outreach, how they're teaching the youngers, because part of their uh, task, if you will, is to educate the grades below them. So get some ideas from them. Um, I think <coughs> some real kind of grassroots, simple, low-cost things we could do short term. I think the pay as you throw is going to, we're going to reach a point where our costs are going to keep going as the community builds and gets bigger. Um, and as that, as that approaches, we'll have to come up with a good uh, integration of how we're going to make that happen. The sustainability manager, I think, you know, that's one aspect that they can look at. There's a few other things that a, that a potential sustainability position could impact that could support, but we're also on the finance side juggling um, a communications person perhaps a sustainability manager perhaps, an auditor perhaps, or something. So uh, when it all gets thrown into the mix, um, you know, we're, we've got some tough decisions to make. But I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's all or nothing with this. I really think that there's some good things we can take out of this report, take some steps forward, start moving that needle. Uh, nothing's going to happen in one cycle anyway. But, but take some of these recommendations, start moving them forward, and, and I, I think we'll see some, some positive results from it. I do. Mm -hmm. John. Um, first, I, I want to say thank you, especially Deb. That was absolutely a great presentation. Very informative, very educational, and I appreciate all that, that all of you do. So this is a very important issue. Um, while I'm not a member of a liaison of this committee, I am a liaison or board member of Eco Maine, um, which I sit with Mike Shaw. So this is um, a very serious and a very um, important issue for Eco Maine and our partnership with them. Um, because there are really residual issues that um, surround this one particular issue. Um, in particular, in my focus on why it was of interest last year as part of the finance is really the long-term cost impacts about EcoMain and the waste hauling and the waste management and what's being put in because of Scarborough's contribution to land closures. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we're looking at about a million and a half dollars in eight years as a result of everyone's trust, not just ours, but the part of that, you know, that's in Scarborough. So there's, there's other residual effects of this particular program. I do think it's important to note that South Portland recently went to the roadside composting after almost pursuing the same path because they originally started down that path of wanting to do pay as you throw and doing the bags, said no, they didn't really like the idea of paying for bags and pursued this composting. So I think it's interesting. Who is another owner of EcoMain and a big contributor? So I think that we need to look at our partnership with EcoMain and see how we can leverage that in whatever program that we roll out because it's going to be very important. It could become maybe a leader with other communities as well. Um, the other piece I wanted to mention is that I think if anything that you've done for me is that um, you've proven <coughs> that um, we have a responsibility to do something. 
we, we can't just sit back and just say we can continue what we're doing because there has to be a solution to our problem, mm -hmm. which is not just um, cost because it's in a way net neutral based upon the pro proposals, but we have a responsibility to manage it better for the better, you know, better being of society and, and our community as a whole. Um, the last piece I wanted to mention was, um, uh, yeah, that, that was really it. I, I just think the, the bigger issue for me is the residual cost and the impact that this can have longer term and not really about the, what's going to happen in eight years because that was decided 20 years ago when they started <coughs> composting, but it is about what it's going to cost in 20 years or 30 years. So um, I appreciate what you've done. I, I really like it. Really, really like it. The report really has tremendous depth. Oh, mm -hmm. the Imar work, uh, something that has not been mentioned, but which has proven useful to the community. Pilot programs are available. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some septic, uh, some sewered uh, parts of our community. So uh, those offer opportunities to try and uh, hit those areas that perhaps uh, are <coughs> most fertile for for uh, generating uh, uh, an effective trial program. Uh, I thought that this proposal that the Energy Committee has put out and, and Deb's effort on this, and I've worked closely with her for months and months now on this, uh, uh, is really a measured approach. It's not uh, uh, asking us to do things that would go too fast. Uh, uh, the idea of having an uh, organized effort mm -hmm. at looking at the merits of the pay-as-you-throw options mm -hmm. uh, because the multiple trash barrel size is can be a kind of that's your choice. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think that that's something uh, the part-time sustainability coordinator, I think we ought to throw to the uh, uh, finance committee and ask the town manager to do an analysis <coughs> that says because there's going to be other positions mm -hmm. that you're going to have to make recommendations on mm -hmm. uh, and whether or not this one actually appears viable based on dollars and cents. So if it pays for itself then uh, it becomes a lot easier to uh, add it to advance ourselves to that education piece, to that analysis piece, uh, that coordination piece, and so uh, those, those, I do think that that's where we ought to go with uh, with the recommendation of the sustainability coordinator and look at it. Uh, I think the composting uh, proposals are get started. They're cheap. Uh, they're uh, we have the relationships now mm -hmm. with the entities, so uh, I, I think we can at least move forward on that. And we'll see what we get to. So that's kind of my my thoughts after six months of this. <laughs> so uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll have it come back with a uh, kind of a proposal as to what we actually want to do based on the input that we received from all of you tonight, and then we'll have just a further in-depth discussion about about moving it to an action. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll thank you. Stand and that thank you.
Welcome to the February 17, 2016 uh, regular Town Council meeting. We just finished a very vigorous uh, hour plus hearing from the Energy Committee on uh, a solid waste uh, disposal uh, recommendation and report. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask you to rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Bayline? Present. Councilor Caterina? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Donovan? Here. Uh, a couple people missing tonight. Uh, uh, Will Rowan, I think, is caught in traffic. Uh, uh, Kate had uh, 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 some uh, knees work done, and uh, hopefully she'll be back for our next meeting. Uh, I'd like to start with general public comments. Anything that is not on the agenda tonight, please uh, feel free to go to the podium and speak your mind. Mr. Chair, yes. I have uh, an email I received that someone wanted me to read into the public comments. Very good. Uh, seeing After. No, uh, anyone else uh, like to speak? No one? We'll close the public comment from the podium and ask <coughs> Councillor Katerina to read. Uh, yes, this is from Marge De Sanctus of 54 Beach Ridge Road in Scarborough, and she apologizes. She was unable to be here in person, but she had another commitment. She just wanted me to read. I have read the resolution for education funding and strongly support the actions of the Scarborough Town Council. The people of Maine voted for a 55% funding of education several years ago, and the state has not fulfilled its obligation to meet that percentage. The state has instead decreased funding since that time. The people of Scarborough, and in fact, any town in Maine deserve to have their funding restored to avoid further reduction of services or increases to taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, minutes of February 3, 2016. Pleasure. <coughs> Move approval. Second. Uh, any adjustments? Sounds like me. Further? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? <coughs> it's unanimous. Uh, adjustments to the agenda. If, if there is no objection, I will ask that the resolution 16003 be moved be heard after order number 16-014 uh, i had asked uh councillor rowan to uh, read that resolution and so if he is able to make it in time i'd like to provide him with that since he's put a lot of effort into into this particular issue uh, moving on to Resolution 16002, Act on the Request to Approve Resolution 16002, Encouraging Healthy Habits for Adults in Scarborough, Maine. Uh, it's going to be read by the Senior Committee uh, Liaison, uh, Peter Hayes. Good evening, everybody. Um, so this is a resolution, it's a proclamation to encourage healthy habits for adults in Scarborough, Maine. Be it resolved by the Council of the Town of Scarborough, Maine and Town Council assembled that whereas February 2016 is National Heart Month and whereas obesity has become a rampant problem in our society with over 62% of adults considered overweight or obese in Cumberland County, including Scarborough, and whereas adults who are overweight or obese have a much higher in incidence of chronic health conditions such as heart attack, diabetes, and some cancers, and whereas increases in overweight and obesity conditions are stressing our health care system, and whereas research has shown that adults can achieve a healthier lifestyle, avoid obesity once they learn about nutrition and the benefits of staying active, and encouraged to take action, and whereas Oasis Healthy Habits for Adults is developed from an evidence-based intergenerational program called Oasis Catch Healthy Habits, and connects peer volunteers age 50 plus with older adults to encourage healthier eating and increase physical activity. And whereas the Southern Maine Agency of Aging is hosting the Oasis Healthy Habits for Adults program here in Scarborough with the support of the Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield Foundation. And whereas in 12 cities across the country, over 7,755 other older adults nationally, including over 415 adults in the Scarborough area, 
have improved their diets, become more active, and share their healthy habits with friends and family members <coughs> as a result of the program. And whereas Oasis Healthy Habits for Adults is a model program that demonstrates that anyone at any age can improve their health and reduce the risk associated with obesity through good nutrition, increased physical activity, and wellness education. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Scarborough Town Council does hereby proclaim Wednesday, February 17, 2016, as the Oasis Healthy Habits for Adults Day in Scarborough and congratulates o Oasis, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue, Blue Shield Foundation, Southern Maine, ARA Agency on Aging, and their volunteers for the innovation, commitment to making a positive and lasting difference in the lives of our citizens. Signed and sealed the 17th day of February 2016 on behalf of the Scarborough Town Council and Town Manager Scarborough Maine. Thank you. And I'd like to recognize Carol Rancourt and some other uh, people. Uh, Carol's much admired and respected former town council member. <laughs> Thank nice, you. Nice um, to see you. I'm here today in my role at Southern Maine Agency on Aging, and I'd like to introduce our volunteers and then our special guest from the Anthem Blue Cross Foundation. Our volunteers, and not all of them are um, older adults. We have one kind of in the mid-range of adult, but she's an adult <laughs> volunteer as well. I, uh, today I have with me um, Peggy York uh, and our photographer, uh, Sharon McDonald. I don't mean Sharon McDonald. I mean Sharon Roberts. Uh, Jean McDonald. Um, and uh, our program manager, Sharon Schulberger. And our other volunteer, Dory Schulberger, there in the background. Our special guest tonight is Marlise Montgomery from the Anthem of Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation. I didn't know if you wanted to make any remarks, Marlise. Uh, we want to say that um, this program is, uh, is, is, has a very serious purpose, but also provides a lot of fun for older adults. We not only have, there's a total of nine lessons about various items in the diet and how uh, they affect you and how much is safe and not safe. There's also a very fun exercise component um, that, uh, w and we've been providing those programs to the Scarborough uh, Senior Citizens Group, and we hope we've done the first uh, uh, three sessions, and we hope that we have one more to go, and there are five new ones in the coming year, so uh, in, in 2016, so we hope to be able to have the healthiest adults in the area in Scarborough pretty soon. Um, we have some gifts to offer you tonight uh, that will help you also on your way to becoming healthy adults. So if my volunteers would like to come forward and pass those out, I'd love to have them do so. We have um, <laughs> magnets that tell you how much sugar, fat, and salt you should be eating by the day. Oh, and you'll be sure to find out if you, if you probably this morning met your Thank goal. You. Thank you. Uh, we have some frisbees, we have Thank some, you, broccoli. Thank some you. exercise balls, Thank and uh, we have a booklet Thank that tells yeah, a number of good recipes yeah. with healthy foods, so Thank please you. enjoy. And you got broccoli, my favorite one. <laughs> wow. We thank, thank you so much for the resolution, and I uh, wish you good adult health. Thank you. Carol, uh, tell us how people can uh, learn more about this program. And oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> they can call Southern Maine Agency on Aging and just mention adult uh, exercise. As you probably know, we have other adult exercise programs as well. We have Tai Chi. We have a program called Matter of Balance. But CATCH kind of is the best of both worlds because it not only looks at diet, but it looks at exercise as well. Uh, we've been lucky to be funded by the Anthem uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation for I think five <coughs> years now. Uh, you lose track after a while. Um, and we v are very appreciative because last year for the first time um, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation nationally gave every state the, the, the power to say yes or no to the program and the main uh, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation said this is a great program we want to keep funding it here in Maine. So we're thrilled to be the host for this program. So you can call Southern Maine Agency on Aging anytime, and our local number is 396-6500, and we also have an 800 number. So, um, and we're in the book. We have a Facebook page and a website. So you can find us under www.smaaa.org. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.
Marley, did you want to say a few words? Marley, I'd love to hear from you also. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. Um, so my name is Marley Montgomery, and I am the manager for community relations at Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield right over here in South Portland. Um, I work very closely with the Anthem Foundation. Um, the Anthem Foundation has been involved with Catch Healthy Habits for, she said, five years. It's incredible that it's gone on this long, but it's something we're very passionate about. The program started out actually introducing this program to elementary school kids. And with about three years or so, Sharon, we worked with area children, teaching them about healthy habits and good exercise and staying physically fit. Um, and then we graduated the program, if you will, to uh, the older adult population. And I had um, a, the great benefit of going into the Salvation Army when we had um, a session in Portland last year and actually watched this. Um, for myself, and it's absolutely amazing to see on the faces of these older adults what they really thought they knew a lot about nutrition. Um, they learned so much, and the educational component is just very polished and sharp and easy to follow, and people left there going, oh my gosh, I had no idea that there was so much sugar in this or that this one small exercise could make so much difference in <laughs> how I feel. So we have been absolutely thrilled beyond words to be a part of this, and I think our grant continues through 2016, and we're anxious to see, Sharon does a great job keeping Anthem up to speed on all of the different events that they have going on, so um, it's been a great experience for us, and we just really want to thank you, Sharon, and all the volunteers that do all the really hard work <laughs> that are in the trenches, and um, we just want to say thank you to you guys, too, so thank you very much for having us here tonight. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you ladies, for, for coming. Very much appreciate your efforts. We love guys, too, though. <laughs> <laughs> we love guys, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need a second. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I believe we, uh, why don't we move it again and, uh, and receive a second. Move approval. Second. Uh, any further comment from the public? None. Move. What was that discussion? Peter. Yeah, Bill, the, the, Mr. Chair, if I, if I may, I, this is something near and dear to me. Part of my career has always been about health and wellness and managing health plans. And I just really applaud you. Obesity is one of the things that's driving the health care costs in the United States. It has huge implications. And, and especially as you look at diets, if any health plan, the top three will be cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, and also cancers, and, and, they're, and they're saying, especially for cancers, 30 to 40 percent of cancers have everything to do with diet and exercise mm -hmm. and other things. So what you're doing is, I just really applaud you, and, and thank you for doing that and bringing it to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, no. Yeah, uh, thank you also. Um, I work with a lot of older people and as a real estate broker. I specialize in work with seniors, and. Uh, I think a program like this is fabulous. The longer we can keep people healthy and out of uh, nursing homes and um, long-term nursing care stays, the better. So uh, I applaud you for this, and I'll make sure to put it up on my Facebook page. <laughs> Other comments? And I certainly share the comments that have been made. It uh, applied your efforts. Obesity is one of the great problems of our time. Uh, and I, I hope efforts like yours make a difference. Uh, further comments? None? All in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Treasurer's warrants, I will sign those later. Uh, resolution order. Order 16013, uh, act on the request to adopt the town of Scarborough social media policy as recommended by the Rules and Policies Committee. Uh, public comment. None closed public comment. What's your pleasure? Move approval. Second. Take it. Uh, Peter, I think you're probably, uh, as Rules and po Policies Chair, I'll give this to you and then to Jean Marie as the head of the communications. Well, actually, I think it's kind of a joint, joint you know, and I, I think, I think the, the, the purpose behind this is certainly as we've looked around and the world's changing and we're finding that more and more people are starting to turn to the social media pages for information, and actually we saw a little bit about that 
in the budget process last year, we thought it was really important that the town really adopt some criteria around. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> How's that traffic in Boston? You know, <laughs> I've seen better. So, so this is an attempt to kind of frame some just some ground rules and some guidance about what we're going to put on social media, how it's going to go up, how the material is going to be, re be reviewed, what we can and cannot do. So that was really sort of the intent behind it. I think it, you know, and I'll turn it to, to Jean Maria. She talks about the communication policy we have and the types of things we're trying to do. It kind of dovetails together. So I don't know if that if that helps or not. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Gatorino. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, just to dovetail uh, with, with Councillor Hayes' comments, um, as you're probably aware, I'm sort of like the communications quarterback, and we're looking to put up a Facebook page for the town. Um, and we are doing a survey on our town website, so when you get a minute, go on the town website, and you should see what's called a pop-up. It pops up and asks you to take a survey, and if you haven't done that, if you would, because it would be very helpful for us. And I've heard from a couple of town managers and town planners across the state who are very curious about what we're doing. Uh, with the social media policy. So we're going to be on the forefront again, which is not a bad thing, uh, to do with this. Uh, I ha we had a great meeting with policy uh, committee the other day. I think we've hammered out something that will work to start. And it's like any document. It's a living document. As in, and as things change and we f find things work or don't work, we can bring it back and tweak it. But I think this is a good start for uh, making sure that we are communicating in an effective way uh, with the citizens of Scarborough. Very good. Councilor Baybine. Thank you. Um, first, uh, to the drafters and to the committee, uh, thank you. I'm part of the committee and had a very uh, um, thoughtful uh, conversation. Um, I do think it's important to note that um, this does not replace the need for human contact and communications face to face, and too often, people look to social media as a means to either disguise or hide um, identity and um, make um, um, uh, less polite comments, I guess is the best way of, of saying that. And I hope that this policy um, kind of weeds that out and gets us into a better spot. And I think it will start that process. Um, the second piece of that is, um, you know, we, we are going to look at, as the committee we did discuss, looking at what is the next stage to this, <coughs> and it's about how we communicate. And I hope that the citizens understand that um, while we focus a lot on finance, uh, it seems um, two thirds of our goal, the global goal for the for this council, um, is around communication, and this is a significant part of that in today's society. So I appreciate the work that has been done on that, and um, look forward to uh, taking it to the next step. <coughs> Other comments. Uh, for, for those out there uh, watching, uh, uh, it, it really was our intention to move very rapidly with the uh, uh, <coughs> Facebook initiative that Councilor Caterina is responsible for in the hands of the uh, town webmaster mm -hmm. uh, at the present time. Uh, our goal <coughs> is to make sure that we effectively communicate with everyone in the community not everyone uses social media, but some segment of the community does, and that's why we're uh, aggressively pursuing uh, this one component. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it, it may be helpful. The, the plan at this point is to, uh, well, I, sh I should back up. There are currently four different town-related Facebook pages. Our intent is to allow the two public safety-related, that's police and fire, to remain independent. Uh, we think that they serve a very particular purpose and, and ought to maintain that independence. But the other two, which are public works and community services, we'd like to kind of roll them up into a uh, general town Facebook uh, page. So that content would certainly be served in a general platform and then supplemented with all sorts of other town-related information as well. So that's the efforts that we've undertaken, and I think that's what you'll see in the next uh, several weeks. Thank you. Uh, other comments? Uh, uh, have we had a motion and second? Yes. 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 Uh, see no further comments. All in favor? <coughs> Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda. Uh, uh,
Councilor Rowan has arrived, and we uh, <laughs> adjusted the agenda thinking that you might be able to arrive in time. Uh, and I have copies of... of the resolution. Oh, here you go. <laughs> uh, oh, season post. Yes. I think before we get to uh, the uh, resolution 16002, we will do order number 16014. Act on the annual seasonal road posting for weight restrictions, if, if necessary, <laughs> from February 25th to May 15th. Uh, any public comment on this? Seeing none, uh, what's your pleasure? Move approval. Second. Okay. Discussion? I, for one, am very excited to see this list because it means spring is coming. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will all applaud that. <laughs> Other comments? Uh, routine matter uh, comes up every year, uh, and we have uh, roads that require this protection, as uh, most people are aware. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, resolution 16-003, act on the request to approve resolution 16-003, urging the Maine State Legislature to pass a significant supplemental appropriation for education uh, known as the GPA appropriation. And I would ask Councillor uh, Rowan if he would read the resolution into the record. Sure, so it's resolution 16-003, urging the Maine State Legislature to pass a significant supplemental appropriation for education, uh, GPA. So be it resolved by the Town Council of the Town of Scarborough, Maine, and Town Council assembled that, whereas the State of Maine is required by law to fund public education at 55% of its cost, but has consistently failed to do so, and whereas State education funding for the Town of Scarborough has shrunk over the last eight years by $1.9 million, and whereas the most significant cause of the loss in revenue has been the failure of the state to fund education at a pace with the growth in statewide school costs and whereas the consequence of this underfunding is to shift the tax burden to property taxpayers and whereas the state's preliminary projection of state education funding for Scarborough in the 2016-2017 budget year is a further reduction in funding of $1.6 million the second largest reduction of any municipality in the state, and whereas the state legislature is contemplating an increase in school funding which could significant, significantly benefit Scarborough, now therefore be it hereby resolved by the town council and town council assembled as follows, that it is of critical importance that the legislature pass a substantial supplemental appropriation for education, GPA, so as to further <clears throat> Excuse me. so as to avoid further reductions in municipal services and further increases in property taxes, and that the Town Council urges our local legislative delegation to su support and promote such an increase. <clears throat> Signed and dated the 17th day of February 2016 on behalf uh, of the Scarborough Town thank Council. Thank you. Uh, uh, public, <laughs> sorry. Okay. public comment. See none. Close it. It's your pleasure. Move approval. Second. Discussion. Well, and uh, I would say that <coughs> Council Rowan has worked uh, very hard to understand a very complicated state funding process and methodology. Uh, and we're very pleased to have had that effort to give us some insight uh, and perhaps a little more standing with our legislative delegation uh, to have them uh, consider supporting us in this circumstance. So thank you. I, and I did want to say it's, it is a very complex formula, and I, I think that it's, it's also very hard to art articulate uh, the complexity of it. And I think that to some extent works against us um, from, from an aspect of, you know, I feel like people have kind of thrown up their hands and said, hey, it's, it's just really complicated. Um, and that's true that, that it is. Um, but we're facing a, a very significant revenue shortfall. Um, 
and we just kind of we need to drive that point home. And I've, I've met with or conversed with the majority of our uh, our representatives, and I, I um, I'm not <coughs> sure that I that I fully articulated just kind of what we're facing and and why we're facing it. But the the uh, the net is that you know the 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 parts of the formula that disadvantage Scarborough are not going to be fixed in in the um, in this legislative session, uh, which is a very short legislative session up in Augusta. Um, but the what will help Scarborough is an additional appropriation from the legislature, um, and any kind of appropriation based on again how the funds are distributed, Scarborough will be the second largest recipient of any uh, additional appropriation, and it's a um, uh, I think it's something on the order of about 4% that we would see yeah. of any appropriation. Pardon? Of, of, if it were like 23 million. And, 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 and I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to say that that's the only possibility right. of an appropriation because that won't make us whole. If, if the 23 million that's being discussed up in Augusta gets passed, we'll, we'll net about 800,000 out of that. Um, um, and we'll still face about 700,000 as, as a shortfall. But, um, but I just feel like it's it's important, and I think this this <coughs> takes a stand, and we're we're urging our representatives to to help out the property taxpayer in in Scarborough and and um, help us get more funding. Other comments, Councilor Gatterian. Uh Yeah, this um, whole resolution it brings to mind a Latin phrase. Being the old Latin teacher that I am, uh, and the Latin phrase is cui bono, c u i b o n o, which means who benefits or for whose benefit is this and there is currently legislation it's in the senate of course they're going back and forth on what they're going to do with it <clears throat> but it would give in essence 23 million dollars the way it stands as of what i understand today back to the schools in the state at the top of what i call the funnel for funding um and, and when you also add in that the referendum for uh insisting that the legislature do the 55 percent with a surcharge of three percent on the wealthiest of Maine taxpayers has been turned in the Secretary of State's office hasn't I don't believe it's been um, approved yet but if it is approved the legislature will be required under state law to take it up before they send it on and see if they can pass it and if they don't then it will go to referendum so there are a couple things up there right now that will make a huge difference in the funding of public education, not only in this town but in the whole state, and will add to the stability of taxes for our citizens. Um, I am very disappointed that I did hear back from Representative Vashon, and she said absolutely not, no, she would not support <coughs> the $23 million as it was passed the other day in the House. Uh, Senator Sorok and Volk, I think they're saying no, but I haven't gotten a straight answer. Senators Millett and, and Representative McLean do support any additional funding uh, for the people of Scarborough. I look at this as I have an obligation as a town councilor to look out for the property taxpayers of this town. And many of these same taxpayers have children in the schools. As a former teacher, I firmly believe that public education and the proper and significant funding of public education is critical to economic development in any community or any state. Um, under the $23 million proposal, $800,000 is the number I was given by Senator Millett, would be returned to the taxpayers of Scarborough, and I don't think that's an insignificant drop in the bucket. Won't make up for the whole 1.5 or 1.6 million we're set to lose, but um, it, it is not an insignificant amount of money. And you need to remember that this is money that you're paying right now in state income tax that could be going for a corporate tax break. I'd rather see it come back to the people of Scarborough, um, but that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll be supporting this um, because I, I, I do agree that we need to support increased funding at, at the state mandated level. But this needs to be a statewide conversation because there, as we have seen, there's a real winners and losers in all of this and each year it changes. But we need to make sure 
that whatever process we have to fund state education is fair and equitable and understanding. So I will support. I am a little concerned about some of the tone and some of the language because actually if you look, not past history, but if you look at this particular year, some of the reasons that we're being impacted are based on a formula, but it's also based on some of the issues that we're facing in our community. We have decreasing student populations, we have quickly increasing real estate values, and we have some issues of how we've chosen to handle debt service that are impacting us. And actually of the 1.6 million, a million of those are those three factors. So we, it, it, at least something like that. So anyway, what I'd like to suggest and like to see is I, you know, and I think, and, and we'll, I really applaud you digging into this and getting the numbers. And I'm kind of sitting here and saying, shame on me as being a member of one of the finance committees. We should be able to look ahead and to start to look at these things and say, gee, this, this, should, this shouldn't be a surprise to us each year. We should be able to see what's happening to real estate. We should be able to see what's happening to our student populations and start to project out what is this going to look like a year from now, two years, or three years. And so we can do a better job trying to, to manage that. So I'm going to support it. But I really think um, you know, that what, what's happening in Augusta a little bit, I understand where the money is coming from, and it's much like the debate that we had here and we've had as a town. We have a threshold that we want to keep as reserves, and it's about 8.33% of our budget. What I understand the $23 million is coming from is reducing the state reserves to a very low level. And that's some of the concern. But what I would really like to apply is in Augusta, this seems to have become sort of an ideological debate that's evenly split between the Democrats and Republicans. What I'd like to do is we as a state need to come together and come up with a much better, fairer, understandable funding formula that takes some of these peaks and valleys out. So I'm going to support it, but I, I want it to take politics out of it and say, <coughs> what do we need to do in the state of Maine to make sure we adequately fund education? So uh, I, I'm also going to support the resolution um, uh, for a couple reasons. Um, one, I, I think what it obviously is is a statement from the council uh, that we should welcome and expect and, and request any additional aid from the state that we possibly can since the majority of our resources are going in that direction. Um, uh, I will also support it because it is just that. It's a resolution. It's not binding. It's just basically a public statement saying we would like this to happen. Uh, I think that's very important because uh, while I do think the, the, the issue in Augusta is very contentious, um, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of things going on. Um, I, I think it's very um, important for us to try and not single out a particular group of, of legislators because I think that it's critical that we look at this from a town perspective. Um, so while I, I hope that, that our legislative contingent will take this under very close advisance, uh, ad, ad, advice, uh, I also think it's critical for people in the community to reach out individually to their representatives as well and express their opinions because that's really what this is, is it's an opinion. Um, I, I think we can do so much as elected officials, but I think the general public can do much more. And I think we have an obligation to uh, uh, make our legislators informed of the decisions that they have to make, much like uh, we need to be informed of the decisions we have to make. So uh, I, I think it's important while they're having these discussions for us as counselors to weigh in with them of if this happens, this is what potentially could happen to the town of Scarborough. This is what we're looking at in terms of budget impacts. So when they make that decision, it's not done in the political vacuum of D's and R's up in Augusta. It's done under the auspices of Scarborough is going to be impacted this way. So um, I, I hope that our relationships with our legislators are strong enough that we can do that both individually as counselors, as citizens, and as well collectively as a council. So I'll support this as well. Um, um, but I, I, I think, you know, ongoing communication and ongoing dialogue is certainly a, a, much, a much more um, constructive approach, I think. John. Thank you. Um, first, to uh, Council Rowan in particular, thank you for drafting and working very hard, um, not only on this resolution, but really um, providing the uh, data that we've been receiving in recent uh, days and months um, regarding the formula, because it is very important. Um, I, I would mention that 
while the formula itself might be complex and very difficult to understand because of the variables that are included, the issue, I think, is actually very simple, and the PICUS report said that. And mm -hmm. what it said was that, um, to the best of its ability, the formula does its best at distributing the amount of money that is needed, or I should say that is um, being spent on education. However, the second part of that report says mm -hmm. it is broken because there isn't enough money going into the system. And this is about the amount of money that's going into right. the system. And the impact is actually very simple as well. It's an introverted effect. Um, the less money you put into it, communities that are struggling and still having economic recessions or economic difficulty will receive more. <coughs> the more money you put into it, communities like Scarborough, while those other communities will still get more than they usually get, yeah. they will get less of more and Scarborough will at least remain balanced and whole for what it's already been contributed to. So it comes down to, do you support more money towards <coughs> education? I will take this formula for what it is for the next 20 years if I have to. It's about the money that goes into it, and that's what's not happening. And when you think about where the money is coming from, we are in a um, cycle of economic growth, of um, income tax are exceeding projections, Recently, um, this administration has taken, I think it was about $800 million out of um, restricted reserves that was intended for um, teacher, uh, teacher um, uh, retirement benefits mm -hmm. and put that into reserves to beef up their reserves so it's not like they don't have the money. It's whether or not they wish to spend it on education. And I think personally that they have an obligation to meet based upon the law of 55%. If anything, even without that law, they have an obligation because that is the purpose of at least in my, my view, sales tax, income tax, all the taxes that are paid, the number one priority should be education, and it's at that state level so that it eases the burden at the local level. Um, I am, too, a little bit disappointed with the language, but um, for very different reasons. I think that one word in the last um, uh, now, therefore, where it says urges, um, I would actually suggest stronger language, um, but I won't make that amendment because I think it should either be request require, demand, insist, however you want to word that to our delegation because they do have a responsibility to represent the entire community and we look for that balance and I personally don't believe we're finding that balance as it relates to the conversation around education from that delegation. Um, what I would like to ask is that um, in addition, once if this is approved, um, I really want to encourage the town manager or the town clerk to forward the resolution to the secretary of the mm -hmm. Senate and to the clerk of the house because it could become part of the communications calendar in which it's then shared with the rest of the state because I hope it is a, um, a, a very loud statement to not only our delegation but to the state that we support education. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted the, uh, everyone out there to know that we've had a very good dialogue with our legislative delegation, mm -hmm. a, a, a very good exchange uh, we wanted to make them aware of the resolution, uh, allow them the opportunity to provide information back to us, uh, and, and it was a very good exchange. And so I wanted the public to be aware that that has taken place during the last week. It's helped to educate all of us uh, a little bit better on some of the issues that uh, they must face. Uh, and I think we, in turn, have uh, been offered the opportunity to personally express uh, our own concerns and frustrations. Uh, we're losing 35% of our state funding in one year. We lost the factors that were the major factors were a drop in our enrollment. We lost 35% of our, oh no, we didn't lose 35% of our enrollment, we lost 3% of our hmm. enrollment. <clears throat> the other major factor uh, cited was an increase in the assessed value of our community. 35% loss of funding, a 1% increase in assessed values. That's what one year did to our funding. Uh, it's not fair for a system to take $1.6 million out of a budget and shift it over to property taxes so that the uh, property taxpayers and their elected representatives on the town council have a choice. 
either a, an enormous increase in taxes or a decrease in services. But either way, it's a high impact thrust upon us. Uh, and that's simply not fair. I am glad we've had the opportunity to communicate back and forth with our council members because I thought it was a very civil, courteous discussion. Uh, it reflected well on, I think, the town council representatives and uh, the seriousness of our elected uh, uh, delegation in Augusta. Uh, I'm confident that they appreciate the circumstance that's presented and the gravity of our situation. And I am confident that they will do their duty to support the people who have elected them. Yes. I'm sorry, I wanted to add one more point. I, I just wanted to piggyback on, to, on Councilor Hayes' comment around planning. While there must be a state solution around the formula and around the planning of it, I hope that people understand at least um, as chair of finance, and I think there's a consensus on the finance committee, is that we as a community need to start looking at this issue locally so that we're not constantly reacting to this type of news in a knee-jerk reaction and trying to um, absorb <coughs> such a significant uh, guarantee. The, the point in which we're at now and the point in which I think we're going to be called a minimal receiver is pretty small, but we need to start planning for that, and I think there's a commitment by the Finance Committee, so I want the community to understand that we are looking at it at least locally. Thank you. Sorry. Yep. Uh, other comments? <coughs> uh, ready to vote. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Yay. Thank you. Non-action items. Uh, none Correct. at this time. <coughs> Standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Chris, why don't we start down there with you? Uh, so, Energy Commission hasn't met since last time, but they gave their report today for the um, uh, refuse plan, or ref recycling plan. A um, lot of hard work went into it, and I, I thank the council for taking the time and out of the workshop agenda to listen to that. I know it was. Uh, a, a long time coming, um, and uh, for the for those who weren't able to see the workshop ahead of time, there's uh, I know it's going to be posted on our website, I believe. Um, there was some good analysis done on potentials for reductions in um, um, the overall mass waste stream through either uh, increased recycling rates or uh, predominantly through composting. So it's a very thorough report, very in depth. Um, and uh, I would encourage anybody in the community to get out there and take a look at it, and also uh, council members to, to really dig into that because there's a lot of background information there that, that I think will be very helpful as we move forward and, and, and decide the best, best path forward. Uh, on the school side of things, um, uh, they're in uh, vacation this week, so um, nothing, nothing uh, relatively new. I think we've still got on the second is the um, knee, uh, uh, NESDEC, forum for elected officials and business leaders. So I believe it is March 2nd, 7 p.m. at the high school resource room. Certainly that's a venue for the counselors to participate, uh, as well as local business leaders. I think there was an email today from SEDCO that went out um, uh, to the business community, which uh, was, will be very helpful as well. So the more that come, the better. It's kind of an opportunity to, to weigh in on some of the attributes and some of the, uh, some of the things you, you want to see in the next superintendent. Um, short of that, uh, next week the, we'll, we'll reset, so uh, hopefully the information coming out of the school, uh, school board will be a little more timely. It'll only be a week old instead of two weeks old, so uh, with the offset we'll be able to do things a little more timely, I think. Oh, and also, not to steal Councillor Rabon's thunder, but Joint Finance did meet. Um, I thought it was a very productive meeting and, and we're making uh, certainly making some steps forward and I'll, I'll let obviously him express the details, but I think uh, the process is, is proving to be very, um, very beneficial, I think. So glad to see that continue. Thank you. And I guess I'm embarrassed to say or humbly apologize um, since the last time we've met. I've been on vacation with my family skiing and came back on a red eye last night, so I'm a little <laughs> behind schedule. So I'll, I'll make up for lost time next time. Thank you. John. Mm -hmm. uh, finance, uh, first, uh, there's two sets, uh, joint committee, uh, the joint committee met, um, and uh, we are beginning to uh, get our work really underway. Um, what we ended up um, talking about is really we're going to start the conversation around 
metrics and uh, what are the measures that we want to start measuring our community by financially, um, as well as other metrics um, relating to that. Um, the name, actually I forgot the new name of the agency, but I think it was called CPAIR, um, which is really um, um, our consultant that's coming in and actually helping us understand some of those uh, metrics that are out there. I do want to mention that that is really more related to school metrics um, because that is what the um, available data really supports from an evaluative standpoint. It's very, the resources available for community metrics around municipal services other than education is very limited. So we'll have um, a separate conversation in our own finance committee about where we would like to see that. Um, there will be a presentation, I believe it's March 24th. It is a workshop presentation. It's not a dialogue in which uh, CPAIR will come in and give the joint committee um, their presentation and um, some of that information. So uh, please uh, watch because we are uh, televising those meetings and it will be very, very informative. Um, future conversations will also be about, we're going to be undertaking pretty soon, talking about the, um, the public forum, uh, just solidifying what that process is going to be, um, as well as uh, rolling out the new website or at least the page in which um, shared information <coughs> is going to be uh, provided, uh, both succinctly as well as in new formats um, so that there isn't um, mismessages or con uh, confusing information. Uh, the Town Council's Finance Committee also met. I really undertook um, three issues, uh, two of a larger nature, the other one is more of planning. Just to mention in our March meeting, which is the second Tuesday, sorry, second Wednesday of the month, um, we will actually have a presentation by our financial advisor regarding uh, bonding. Um, so it will be a very informative uh, session as well. Um, and then the other two issues, um, one was around legal services. We did an evaluation of legal services as required by policy. Our policy states that we're to receive a report from the manager annually around legal services and review our contract um, at least every three years and make a recommendation uh, around an RFP to the council. Um, it was the decision of the um, unanimous decision of the committee um, that um, we recommend that no RFP be sent out, that we continue our services as we have since 1969 uh, with our current legal counsel and that we did discuss the benefits of that type of relationship over that uh, type time frame. Um, and I, we did have kind of a beginning conversation around the usefulness of the policy and whether or not um, that should continue <clears throat> going forward or should be either eliminated or replaced with something that's more relevant uh, for today's council. Um, so that will hopefully come forward through either rules and policy or maybe even finance. We'll have to see where that comes from. Um, and then last, um, there was a lengthy, lengthy conversation. Actually, the majority of it was around fund balance. Um, both where it is as a projection as of the fiscal year that ended June 30th, 2015, which is on an unaudited basis, um, you know, and what we're going to do is really uh, take that to the next level and have a joint conversation with the joint committee uh, to talk about what are the sources of that, um, that uh, surplus this past year, um, what the actual amount is, because there can be um, there's a, there could be a lot of confusion because actually fund balance is very complex. While you might think you have a lot of money, uh, some of that is committed and dedicated in the new year, so you have to be careful on how you interpret that information. But it's very important because we are now projected to be above our policy limit, which is 10%, and um, how we should then um, enact our policy um, around that, um, as well as maybe where do we move our policy given a different time than when it was originally written. So that will be coming forward as well, and we'll have that conversation. Um, <coughs> FedCo meets tomorrow, um, as a, so that meets at 7.30, so there has been no update since the last meeting. Um, EcoMaine will be having their meeting, and hopefully um, I'm going to be reaching out to Mike Shar. Um, I think that based on the Energy Committee's um, presentation tonight, I hope that uh, we look towards uh, developing a partnership with EcoMaine around our energy policy, and particularly solid waste management, so we'll take that under advisement as well and uh, get their participation and how that might help us. But um, that um, is all of my information today. Thank you. Councillor Rowan. I had no committees meet since the last meeting. Councillor Katerina. Yeah, um, Conservation Commission was postponed until March. Long range planning, we had a discussion with one of the developers in town regarding allowing the number of units within certain size buildings to be increased as we did with TVC. In other words, if you've got a certain square footage building, why is it limited to, say, 12 apartments? If I can fit 14 in there was a question of a developer. So we discussed that. 
um, as well as um, looking at um, long-range planning of municipal facilities. You know, what do we have now? What would happen in the future? We've just started working on that, so that's pretty interesting. Um, <coughs> Communications, actually, this is a question for the manager. Have we heard any more about the Facebook or what's going on with that? Or? <coughs> I, I don't I, I don't have an update okay. for you at this point, no. All right, I'll check with you tomorrow on <coughs> that. that. would be great. That would be the next step would be to have a Facebook uh, page up and running to at least at least a one-way information as to this is what's going on with ordinance and this is, you know, whatever. Um, it would be informative to people. Um, <coughs> I, I know there has been some question with people have asked me about the school board workshop, which is February 25th. They have invited, the school board has invited the legislative committee to come and talk to them. Apparently they do it annually, and I'm looking at Ms. Cayazzo because he used to be on the school board. Um, <clears throat> and so it's not a public hearing. I know that some people are under the impression it was a public hearing, but it's not. <clears throat> it's just a, a discussion that the school board will be having with the legislative delegation on matters of importance to the school board. But I certainly encourage people to go and listen or watch it on TV, if at all possible, <coughs> just to hear um, what the presentation is. Um, and <coughs> the last thing would be, it's actually a request, and I'm going to start coughing here. Can we send the copy of that resolution to the Maine Municipal Association? Because I know Jeff Herman would be interested in mm -hmm. seeing that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. That's it. <coughs> no, uh, I, I attended the uh, vision committee uh, uh, meeting uh, last week. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, it's a long-range view uh, by people who have come together from uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the Scarborough Chamber of Commerce, and the Scarborough Econo Economic Development Corporation. Uh, so uh, that group has been uh, holding annual summits for the last several years, and the focus of those uh, has been, the, the message coming out of those summits has been improve communication between the different agencies of municipal government uh, in Scarborough, uh, uh, how we get word out to the community, how the community uh, gives us feedback back. Uh, so they've been right there at the same place, I think, that the town council has been. Uh, and as our team ma manager has said, how his senior leadership team have been. So uh, it was good to hear that. Uh, covered a number of things which I don't think they're ready to go prime time yet. Uh, so I'll defer uh, uh, detailing those, but uh, some additional ways in which to more effectively communicate. Um, attended the Joint Finance Committee meeting uh, as a spectator uh, uh, this past week. Uh, and uh, there is a significant effort at doing a data analysis that is going to uh, look at how is Scarborough school system doing, what are the natural uh, communities for comparison, and how do we do against them. Uh, uh, and that is going to be the subject of uh, a public hearing or meeting on March 24th. Uh, and I look forward to that very much because I think that's going to be significant information uh, uh, for all of us. Uh, the uh, Energy Committee report, for those who missed the 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. presentation, uh, uh, report on uh, our, uh, the town's trash issues was as good a report, I think, as I have ever heard. I've heard other council members say the same. Uh, special thanks to Deb McDonough, who did uh, yeoman's work mm. uh, to prepare it. Uh, 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 she was assisted also by the town manager, who also worked hard on that. Uh, and uh, I think from the feedback back from the council members, uh, the town manager and I will work hard to advance those issues and get them back before you for, uh, for action. So, it for uh, town manager's report, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple quick things, just housekeeping first. Uh, Councilor 
Katarina mentioned the long range facility plan that's worked through the staff level is now uh, been taken through the long, ra long range planning group and we will have uh, it as the subject of your next workshop two weeks from now. Uh, so we'll have staff provide a cursory or initial look and I suspect it's a work that will continue on once we get further feedback from you as well. So we're starting to take this out into the community, get some feedback beyond just the staff level at this point. Uh, I did address the chamber in the so-called state of the town uh, annual address. I, I, I'm not sure if that's the <coughs> best way of characterizing it, but it's an annual event. I do uh, look forward to addressing the chamber. I think my comments were well received, and in fact, I'll be taking the same presentation on the road uh, Friday this week to the Kiwanis Club. And the presentation is prepared in such a way that it's generic enough that uh, Karen Martin can offer the same presentation, Dan Bacon, and really any number of us can offer. And we think that's important to uh, to be you know telling the same message out there and, and really hitting the same high points. Uh, that presentation <coughs> is available both on the town website and SEDCO's website if you're interested. It's really well done. <coughs> uh, I've been occupying a lot of my time in the last 10 days or so with uh, performance evaluations for my senior staff. This, will, this is the second year that we've committed to doing it um, for all non-union employees uh, in town. It's really proving to be a, a really productive process, time consuming, but productive. Being the second year, we're spending a lot of time focusing on the goals that we set for this past mm -hmm. year and really finding it to be a, a great opportunity for reflecting, but also then looking forward as well. Uh, we're in full budget preparation mode. Uh, my my uh, department heads are working with their staff, preparing all their uh, budget submissions at this point. Um, CIP projects are starting to flow in. So this month and through mid-March is really the high time for, for departments to be uh, doing all the heavy lifting in budget preparation. I just want to report Winterfest did happen finally after three cancellations on Monday. Uh, in hindsight, the two cancellations were spot on. They really couldn't have had them for one reason or another. And we hit this wonderful window. Uh, it wasn't terribly cold. Uh, the ice was terrific. And then, of course, we all know what weather we've had in the last 24 hours. So uh, we're thankful to get that in place. And it's proving to be difficult to find a, winter, uh, uh, a weekend uh, in the coast of Maine to have a, a winter fest. But uh, one way or another, we pull it off. And lastly, just on behalf of Councilor St. Clair, uh, she did want me to relate, and I've done this to her colleagues on council, but also to the public. She's been unexpectedly delayed in the hospital, uh, doing well as I understand, but she doesn't have access to her town email. And so for those of you that may be trying to reach out to her, don't take her lack of response as anything other than the fact that she simply isn't able to right now. She assures you that uh, she'll get uh, back to everyone once she has a chance to do so. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Great. <coughs> Council comments? Start sure. Um, so I have only one item. Uh, this is the, or two items, I should say. This is the week of uh, um, being kind or the kindness, I think it's Kindness Awareness Week. So um, my gift to all of you is that I will be brief tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only item I really wanted to bring up is that I hope, uh, uh, first I want to say thank you to the citizens that gave me a call because I found out that my name was on the unclaimed property list with the state of Maine. Um, so uh, I'm getting a little post uh, Christmas present coming. I don't know how much or what or why, but we'll figure that part out. But I want to say thank you to those that called me. Like I had a ton of calls. It was great. But it's a reminder to everyone that they should go out to the state site and take a look um, so that way they can see whether or not they have something available. But uh, as part of my kindness to all of you, I do want to say thank you for all your service to the council. It's appreciated. Councilor Rowan. Uh, so I, I wanted to apologize for being late this evening. I, um, I was, uh, took longer than I thought. Uh, I had an appointment in Boston with my daughter. Um, and we made it back as quickly as we could, and I really appreciate the adjustment to the schedule um, to allow me to be here for that. I do appreciate that. Uh, my only other comment is uh, thank you for whoever yeah. left the chocolate oh. and, the, uh, <laughs> and the gratitude beads on our, on our desk. But. Somebody heard me. <laughs> I'm not going to say much because I'll start choking again. I'm having one of those nights. But thank you very much for the chocolate and the uh, kindness week. It's been fun. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, a couple things. I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately not going to be brief. 
<laughs> so I, I, I know it's kind well, of sweet, but I know, I know, I'll, I'll break the record. Um, I, I just wanted to also piggyback on, on Tom's comment about the state of the town. Um, though we didn't get it by letter, we did get it by email this time. So maybe maybe next time we could do an official one. That would be that'd be nice yeah, to hear the, the presentation. I think that would be good. So I, I'm joking, of course. I, I, it was very very thorough report. So I thought that was well received. Um, I want to follow up again also on the 25th. Thank you, Councillor Caterina, for reminding me of that um, the school board workshop uh, with the legislators um, as the liaison I have offered um, to to Chairperson Bealey to um, receive any questions that counselors may have. I'd be happy to, to take those and uh, unedit them <laughs> and send them directly <coughs> on to, to uh, Chairperson Bealey to see if, uh, if that's something that they could address if they have the time or, or I mean, obviously no, no promises, it's their meeting, but if there are questions that are obviously relevant to education, then uh, it's something that, that we'll have the opportunity to, to look at. Um, I, I did just want to make a couple quick brief comments around the, the funding situation and what's going on in Augusta. And I, I think what we're seeing here uh, in Scarborough is also an indication of what's happening. We're, we're, we're starting to muddle things a little bit. Um, I think the funding formula is one of those issues where it is what it is. And there isn't <coughs> a lot of political will anywhere in the state to attack that and change it as, as uh, fair or unfair as, as individual communities may think it is. From a school board perspective, it was typically, um, you know, you win some, you lose some. Uh, some years you were, you were on the upside, some years you're on the downside, and, and it's very difficult to predict for whatever reason because the variables are always in motion and there's always factors that, they, that the administration puts in to make it uh, very unpredictable. So, um, but, but the focus of our, of, our, of our attention and our debate should really be on funding. And we're not in this situation as a consequence of the funding formula. We're in this situation as a consequence of um, the actions of the governor. By not having a, a supplemental budget this session, right. he's forced the legislature into a position where they're having to make, uh, use whatever mechanisms they have to supplement the budget. Now, while it is fair to say that um, spending on education on the state has increased every year, it's clear it is not increasing at the pace that the costs are, and that's why the mill rate keeps getting adjusted. So while it's, it's important to have the discussions around the, the formula and what we can do to impact that, I think it's really critical to focus our, our, our attention and our, 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 our efforts, if you will, on funding education as a whole. And I think um, a lot of these challenges in the funding formula would go away with fully funding of education at the 55% level, not just for Scarborough, but for Portland and for every other community that's going through the same situation that we're going through on a regular basis. Um, to the point of reaching you know, minimal allowable, uh, minimal uh, recipient, um, I think from a finance perspective, we need to start looking at that and maybe we need to start planning along the lines of we are a minimal receiver so that we don't have these huge fluctuations that unfortunately the taxpayers and the property taxes have to absorb. I mean, the rule is your, your income tax goes to Augusta to pay for everybody else's education and your property taxes stay here to pay for Scarborough's education. So if you're getting your taxes cut on the income tax level, uh, those individual communities are having to make that up, including Scarborough, on the property tax side of things. I mean, that's just the general cycle of things. We either do that or we <coughs> cut programs. So I, I think it's really important for us to not so much get mired down in the details of the formula and how we can adjust it and things like that, but really try and stay focused on the, the bigger goal, and that's fully funding education. And there's going to be ample opportunity in the coming year um, with different referendum and different initiatives, and, and also keeping an eye on the legislation that's going up through Augusta. Right. When appropriation measures come before them, it's important as counselors, as citizens, to be aware of those and <coughs> let our legislators know that they need to support these initiatives regardless of where they stand on the political spectrum. So um, that's all. I'm sorry it wasn't brief, but I, I do appreciate the kindness week. And um, I, maybe I'll do something different and be extra kind next week just to make <laughs> up for <that. laughs> Yeah, and I, and I guess I'll just piggyback on, you know, Scarborough Kindness Project, but um, they've done a remarkable job. I mean, I, I think that some of the tone of the conversations have changed in this community. Um, they're very active on Facebook. There have been a lot of people. So I, I just really, hats off. I think it's been a great, this is just an example of it, but I think it really is hopefully starting to change some of the dialogue in our community. People are listening. People are being more aware. And I think that's just hats off and kudos. And thank you very much for those that are 
putting heart and soul in, in, into making this happen. Thank you. On the uh, school funding issue, uh, reference uh, was made to minimal receiver towns. And I, uh, I'm sensitive to people out there saying, what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we oftentimes throw phrases that are defined out there that uh, people are not familiar with. And in that, that case, uh, the state formula provides for a floor below which that's, that's your <coughs> limit. You've, you, you're only going to get X. Uh, and some towns are already there. Uh, uh, but, uh, so they don't benefit much at all, but <coughs> they can't go below it. We're heading towards minimal receiver status. And I've heard several people say that it would be advantageous to reach that point, not because we want to lose more money, that seems to be almost destined, uh, but because it would provide budget <coughs> stability for all of us, uh, because this is uh, more than anything frustrating to have property tax disputes and arguments and debates when not, neither the citizens of the community nor their elected town council members are the reason for it. So uh, I did want to say that. I've also wanted each meeting or a few meetings to reflect on counselor uh, communications and the dialogue that we're having. And it is very evident to me that, that people are uh, uh, very actively expressing their points of view in a very respectful manner, I think that uh, 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 checking in on how we did against that goal every so often is a good idea, and, uh, and I appreciate uh, everyone's efforts. Uh, and with that, I think I'll ask for an adjournment. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Thank you. <laughs> you already got your call. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, <here we> <laughs>